Well, back in uh, 2014, about eight years ago, uh, Ellen and I uh, spent six months living in France when she was on sabbatical um, in southern France and just hit the desktop. Yeah. And um, we didn't speak French very well. Uh, we had high school French and maybe a little bit in college, but it had been many years and our, our French was just atrocious. And Ellen was at a university uh, there where everyone spoke English way better than she spoke French. So, um, so it ended up that um, she wasn't really learning much and we were taking classes, but it was very slow. And then we joined a kayak club and no one spoke more than three words of English. Uh, so we were really on our own to learn French, and it was really the, the best way for us to begin to learn French. So here's the orientation of where we were. Uh, we were living in Montpellier in southern France, not far from the Mediterranean, and we joined a kayak club right on the, on the Mediterranean uh, in uh, Palavas les Flot. And um, <clears throat> as part of our, our journey with the kayak club, we did a lot of local paddles, and we also went as far away as Venice, Italy, way over here on the right, um, for a week of paddling. And um, then within southern France, we did some paddles in the uh, area of Set and the uh, Letang de Tau, uh, this area here, a big lagoon. We did um, a little bit of river kayaking on the Tarn River up here, which we won't talk about tonight, and a four day kayak camping trip down in the northern edge of uh, Spain, the Costa Brava, really uh, Catalonia. Um, so we're going to talk about those trips uh, tonight. But first, introduce you to the club and how this came about. So here's the town, city of Montpellier, a medieval town. We lived on the north side of it here. And the kayak club was out here on the Mediterranean in this small uh, fishing and resort town. Um, and in order to get there, we had no car and there was not good public transit. So we bought bicycles and it was about a nine mile ride across town and then along the Les River here, this green stripe you see down to the coast. And it was a really delightful ride. And we brought our kayak paddles and our dry suits and clothing. Um, this is the town we, li we lived in, uh, Montpellier. Um, this is actually our neighborhood. Um, and this is how we got our kayak gear on our bikes. It was rather awkward, but we worked out a, a solution. And we would ride along the river <clears throat> uh, nine miles each way along the, uh, the levee. It was a very pleasant uh, journey each, each time. And here's where the kayak club was, um, the satellite view. They had a big warehouse uh, to store kayaks and gear. Um, there was a second floor in part of it that had a lunchroom. Out back, they had a, a yard for the, um, the Polynesian outrigger canoes and boat trailers and things like that. And then in the front, they had some uh, storage sheds and, and uh, yard space for kayaks and a dock right on the river. So, um, so we headed out there and we arrived on our bicycles and introduced ourselves. They, we had, they had no idea who we were and uh, asked to join the club. Uh, which cost uh, 200 euro for the year, but that includes the use of all the kayaks and the gear and uh, professional instruction. They have two full-time staff that are employed by the club um, and they give the lessons and they run everything. It's, it's just amazing. Um, and uh, they asked us, you know, what our experience was, but we didn't have any of their ratings, just like every other country, like, you know, the BCU has a rating and the ACA has a rating. The French have their own system of paddle colors, white, yellow, green, blue, and red. Um, but of course, we didn't have any, any uh, qualifications. So they said, well, come on a paddle with us and, um, <clears throat> and, and we'll see how it goes. And so we went on their, their um, regular uh, lesson. Here's the, the, the warehouse where the, these are all the surf skis they have and people who have their own individual kayaks can store them there. And they have very basic uh, gear the spray skirts were, were atrocious. That was one thing we really wished we had. Um, <clears throat> and here's the uh, facilities upstairs, um, which were, were very nice. They also had uh, nice bathrooms with sh hot showers, which are, are handy. Um, 
So we, we grabbed our kayaks, we go down to the uh, dock and we launch on the river and we paddle uh, to the town, um, which is, has lots of fishing boats and tourist hotels. And um, we, uh, we head out to the Mediterranean. And most of our lessons were just out in the, in the Mediterranean or occasionally in the lagoons. Um, and um, our instructor would um, uh, give us a pretty informal lesson. It was usually about two hours long. And this was every Wednesday and Saturday morning. So we had two lessons a week. Um, and they were also very social paddles. Um, and uh, after our first paddle with them, uh, they breathed a sigh of relief. And they, they gave us the, the, the key to the, the clubhouse. They said, you can come anytime you want. You can borrow boats. You don't have to check in with us. Um, you know, you're fine. Um, and uh, we, we pretty regularly took their Wednesday and Saturday classes. And it was really a lot of fun to go paddling with them. We had no idea what to do. Um, all the instructions were in French. And if you've learned other languages, you learn that, discover that when you have a specialized activity, it has its own language. Um, and we just didn't know the terms at all. They weren't in our, our dictionaries. And um, so, you know, they would tell us to do things and we would do what we thought maybe they were thinking of. And usually it was something totally different, but they got used to this and, and we had a good time. Um, and <clears throat> so this was our regular um, routine. We'd come back after the lesson and have lunch upstairs or out in the yard if it was a nice day. And um, we also saw the, uh, the classes for the little kids. They had a little tiny whitewater boats for the kids and it was a lot of fun watching them um, mess around. Um, now, <clears throat> if we wanted to go on a paddle that was further away, then the club would organize a paddle and um, either a member would have a car with a, a hitch or uh, we'd rent a van and split the cost. And the, the club had these trailers to transport you know, 12 or 15 kayaks in a load. So it was pretty easy to uh, take kayaks and go. Um, and keep in mind that many of the club members did not own cars. The beauty of a club like this is, um, you know, a lot of our fellow classmates were showing up on bicycles, just like we were. You don't have, to have a house, you don't have to have a car. Um, it's not very expensive and you join the club and you can kayak. Uh, it was really great. Um, and here we've, we've driven about an hour to the west to the town of Set. And we went for a paddle here on this huge lagoon of salt water, very clean salt water that's known for its um, oyster farms and uh, mussel clams, farms, clams. And clams as well. And these are very different from what we see on Tomales Bay. There are these huge racks and the oysters or the mussels are on um, strings that are dangled from dangling in the water from these racks. Um, and I'm not sure why it's so different. It may be that this is not tidal. So there's not a lot of fluctuation in the water level. Um, just as on a bass paddle, we found a nice place to stop for lunch, but a lot of the French like to have a cooked lunch. So they brought their stoves and heated something up. And just as in Basque, some are renowned for their culinary skills. And um, Michel uh, was known for his chocolate torts, which he readily shared. Um, <clears throat> we would paddle by uh, old, old towns, uh, you know, 16th century church. Um, we'd stop on a beach and because it's the Mediterranean and there are no lunar tides. Um, you can have a cafe right next to your kayak, practically. We we're sitting in a cafe about 25 yards from the kayak having espresso. And this was a common feature of our, of our paddles with the club. <clears throat> Another paddle we did similarly uh, in set was more urban. And here we paddled through the canals of this uh, town that was founded in the 1600s and um, went to a maritime festival. And what better way to see all these old ships uh, than by kayak? Um, it was great fun touring around. Um, on the smaller vessels, we were able to um, chat with the crew and learn about the vessels. And um, it was a very, uh, very fun way to, to visit a maritime festival. And I think with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ellen for this next segment. This one here. 
take it away. Yeah. Ellie. So um, our first overnight trip was uh, this trip to Costa Brava. And here we are um, loading up the kayaks for the trip. And you'll see that um, there's a bunch of the, the club kayaks down here that was for those of us who were in the class. And I think this was some kind of like a graduation paddle or test paddle or something uh, for the class. But then also there was another group of whom uh, this gentleman was one of those members and they brought their own kayaks and they went off and paddled uh, separately from us and, um, and were ahead of us most of the way. And we didn't actually see them most of the trip. Um, so this is, sort of typical rented a van called a camion and drove down to Spain and um, and launched uh, up here in this small town and I don't remember all the town names but and then we paddled out around here and uh, and camped and then did this crossing here and then more paddling and camping and we camped on the beaches and um, so here we are launching. And uh, so down here at Port de la Selva. And then we paddled around these amazing cliffs to Caraque. And uh, just like we, Tom had lots and lots of slides with caves and boats and so on. And I said, but you know, these aren't that different than, <laughs> than um, Mendocino. So I cut a few of them out. So all kinds of beautiful caves. Uh, here we are stopped for lunch in one of these little coves. Um, the main difference is the landscape uh, is quite different, you know, the, the buildings and so on. <clears throat> here we are landing for our first camping beach. And uh, after being on the water all day, uh, this is our, our um, leader who's uh, leading us in a bunch of exercises here to stretch out after uh, paddling. And then um, some of the club members loaned us uh, a tent. In fact, I think it was a brand new tent that, we, that they had never used before and they let us uh, use it. And, um, and then they also loaned us a cook stove and, and cooking kit and so on. <clears throat> And um, here's, we climbed up on the cliffs and looked down and you can kind of see our campsite down there. And, um, and one of the things that's interesting is you can see how close we're camping here. We're just a boat's length from the water because there are no tides. It's really quite remarkable. And then the next day, um, this is a lighthouse up on the cliffs and more caves. And then we paddled into Kadake and, um, and we landed, this is a landing for lunch again. Here we are going to lunch for a little coffee, or maybe not lunch, but a little coffee shop um, stop here. Um, stop and have, have our coffee and our tea and, uh, and then walk back to the boats and, and launch again. And then um, we had this long crossing. And this was actually really interesting. So um, the, <clears throat> the group got split up. We were supposed to land over here, um, but the group that we were in, what you have to realize, none of these boats had skegs. And um, in the Mediterranean, you often have a cross wind as you're going along shore because the wind is coming off the land. And so um, some people were not able to, um, ma to maintain uh, their heading. And so we ended up going into this area and we landed here. You can see it was pretty windy. Um, and we landed here and then everybody got on their cell phones and figured out where the rest of the group was. And, and then we... Uh, <clears throat> We hung around for quite a while in town here. Tom and I went out and got some um, gelato, which is a really famous thing to have in Catalonia. And, and then we got back on the water and paddled back to where we were all supposed to land, which was here under this, um, I, I, I think part of this was like a Phoenician um, era, uh, 
um, ruin. And then on top of it was built a church and so on. And here we are on this beach and it's in April and, um, and we're, and we just land and we unload all our gear and just leave it here. And when we landed, there were a bunch of people sunning themselves, local people out on the beach and so on. And we wait till sunset we, and we, we sit here and we're cooking dinner, we're chilling our wine in the surf um, and enjoying our meal. And then after we eat and it starts getting chilly and all of the beachgoers leave, then we set our tents up. And we asked some of those French people, we said, well, so why are we waiting to set our tents up until almost dark? And they said, well, because it's not legal to camp here. <laughs> and we said, well, but so what, if it's not legal to camp, then why are we camping here? And they said, because we're French. <laughs> And also because it was not the high season. And so we could get away with this. And here we are washing dishes. And we went for a walk after dinner up to look at the ruins here. This was a well that Tom's sitting next to. And, um, and here, it, this is in dawn, at dawn. You can see that we have our tent set up up here. Um, sort of, and some people have their tents set up down here. And then we took our tents down and then uh, had breakfast and then uh, launched. And um, we're not, let's see. Sorry, how do Click I go? There we go. Okay, and so here we are launching in the morning from that, that beautiful beach. And um, so then from that beach, then we paddled to our next area and passed more amazing cliffs and with um, lookout towers and so on, and lots of uh, caves. And some of these cliffs were really dramatic. So we were down on the water and we're paddling along these really tall cliffs. I don't know how many meters tall do you think these cliffs, these were hundreds of meters tall. And we notice that there's fishing lines in the water and we look up and, and way up on top of the cliff, you can see the fishermen up there and, and there are the fishermen up there and their fishing lines are coming down here to us. So, and then um, one thing that was remarkable to me was how little life there was, how little wildlife there was in the Mediterranean. Um, this was one of the few places where we saw any intertidal life. And of course, there's not a lot of intertidal because there's not a very big intertidal because there's no tides at all. And so everything's kind of all, um, compressed. Uh, but we did find um, sea urchins. So these are urchins. And as soon as we found these, everybody decided that it was time to have lunch <laughs> and collected a lot of sea urchins. And then we, when we landed for lunch, we um, cracked open the sea urchins and ate the gonads. But it was pretty remarkable to me how little wildlife there was. We saw a few birds, um, but no marine mammals. And we saw sea hares in the river Les at sort of at the river mouth, um, but really not even that much in the way of gulls or anything. Um, it, it's really pretty sterile. And I don't know if that's because it's been overfished or just because it's not as productive as we have as our water here where we have all this cold water upwelling. But here's another cave. You can see the water is quite clear. <clears throat> And then our next, uh, the next place that we camped was uh, right across from this, um, this hotel that was pretty much empty at night. And here we are landing at our camping beach. And here you can get a sense of how close we are uh, tenting to the beach. You just don't have to worry about the tide coming up. And there we are having dinner. And there we're looking across at that, that um, hotel and there's lights on and so on, but you can see most of the windows are, are 
dark, and that's because it's the off season. And uh, and then we launched the next morning, and we really wanted to to go into this town, and because this was uh, Cadique, which is the town that Salvador Dali lived in, and there's a museum there, and people really wanted to go to the museum, but we didn't have time because we needed to get to our next location. Um, <clears throat> so we launched more beautiful cliffs. These cliffs are really amazing. There were there's these vertical pink and black stripes. Um, the pink is rhyolite and the black is basalt. Yeah, so it's a it's a volcanic um, thing. And then in these cliffs, there are these really dramatic, very tall caves. And this is uh, this is the cave, right? No. no. Okay. There's another cave. So you can see that these how tall these caves are. That, so I think this. Here. Yeah. Now we're getting to it. We're getting close to. So the cave that I wanted to mention is this cave, which is um, this is a really famous cave that uh, on certain days of the year at dawn, the sun shines into this cave and this cave is a hundred meters deep, but it's, you can see it's very tall and it, this, it stays about this width most of the way back into the cave. And at a certain time of the year, the sun rises and at dawn, the light shines all the way to the back wall of the cave. And Salvador Dali apparently um, arranged one of these mornings when that was happening to have a choral uh, concert in this cave at the time that the sun uh, rose and shone in to the back of the cave. Here we are in that cave. We were there not, not at dawn and not um, at quite the right time of year, but it was still, there was still a pretty good sun angle. Um, into the cave. And so here we are pretty close to the back of the cave looking out towards the, the opening. So from there, from uh, dawdling around that cave, then we paddled around more cliffs and uh, finally paddled our last day was paddling into La Franca. And that's where we landed and um, where we met <coughs> a van. Uh, and we waited all day for one group to basically, I think they hitchhiked all the way back to our vans on, uh, at the other coast and then drove over to, to meet us. And so we sat around in this town all day waiting for that to happen, for that um, portage to happen. And this is an interesting town. There's all these boat houses um, in the in the cliffs on which all the housing is built. And you can see people out enjoying the water. It was pretty warm, even though it was in April. And here's more of these boathouses. So this town is really focused on the Mediterranean, on the water. And here we are finally coming in uh, for our final landing. And um, now I'm gonna pass it on to, to Tom. Okay. And uh, now we're gonna we're gonna proceed to uh, Venice, um, which is not some place we expected to kayak uh, with a French kayaking club. But um, every several years they make a, a pilgrimage to Venice for this special event, the Voga Longa, um, this big human-powered watercraft event. And we actually spent an entire week there. Uh, we rented vans and and drove all our kayaks there. And this is the Venetian Lagoon. And we all think about Venice and, and maybe uh, Murano, um, but the Venice, Venetian Lagoon includes a, a large area and many islands. Um, which some we, inhabited and some not. Right, and we kind of explored almost everything you see in this, in this uh, satellite view. And um, to keep costs down, we, we camped um, and there isn't really any camping in Venice. So we camped up here on this spit of land, the Lido, that, that separates the Venetian Lagoon from the Adriatic Sea. So we stayed in a campground that was on the Adriatic side because everybody wants to be by the beach. But of course, we really wanted to be by the uh, lagoon. Um, but we camped there and then we would, use, would drive uh, to various put-in places, usually 
uh, Punta Sabioni right in here um, to do our explorations of the lagoon by kayak. Um, so <clears throat> here's our uh, caravan. We had four vehicles, three of them towing trailers with kayaks and uh, the, and that one the Polynesian uh, outrigger. Outrigger. And here's the campsite, a bunch of tents. Uh, we had uh, a big cook tent, some tables, and some of us were able to stay in these bungalows. Um, Ellen and I had a bedroom in this bungalow, which was very nice. Um, and uh, we brought tables and china and silverware, and we had uh, uh, beer and wine and hors d'oeuvres before dinner every night. And um, the food was all handled by Arnaud, our, our leader. I mean, this guy was incredible. He cooked for 34 people. He would go out every couple of days to a grocery store and come back with a car full of groceries. And he had two of these big burners and about three big pots. And he was a master at, at making these great one pot meals um, and salads. And um, so we had these very uh, tasty, nutritious meals. And he also provided lunch, uh, sometimes a cold salad, sometimes sandwich fixings with some fruit and cookies. And so we, we would carry our lunch with us in the kayaks. Um, and it was a very sociable, um, relaxing week uh, camping in this campground. And um, each day we would split into four pods, one in each of the vans. And we would sometimes go to somewhat different places to avoid overcrowding. We'd have a meeting, um, a group meeting to talk about the plans for the next day. And then um, this was our pod. We had seven of us. We didn't um, get a trailer. We had to load all our kayaks on the yes, roof of the we, van, which we, was quite an ordeal. So here we are <laughs> learning how to load seven kayaks on a van, and we got really good at it. Um, you know, by the third day, it was it was just no sweat at all. And of course, we were only going about two or three miles. Um, and this is a rented van. Right. <clears throat> so here's an example of one of our paddles. Um, this is not Venice. This is actually Burano, this island here. And uh, this is um, Mazzorbo and uh, Torcello. Uh, we also visited a, a little convent on an island here. Um, we actually spent a couple of days in this area. And uh, we would just paddle along and go through these islands with their canals and find a place to pull out our kayaks and uh, eat our lunches and um, goof around and, and uh, most this is where I learned about how French women pee. And so if you back up this near, right near where we're eating lunch, there was this area that had taller grass that was maybe a foot tall. And all the women just squatted down in the tall grass. We all had skirts on and we just squatted down and peed right there in front of everybody. <laughs> But because we had skirts on, nobody knew what we were doing. And they had a little song they sang while we did. <laughs> anyway, go on. Thank you. <laughs> um, most of our stops involved coffee. Uh, <laughs> Which is why we needed to pee. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and here we're, we're paddling over to um, uh, Burano, uh, known for lace making, um, paddled through some of the canals. It's also known for very brightly colored. Uh, houses. And um, again, we found a place to uh, pull our kayaks out under some grass and uh, wander around the town, check out the, the scene and uh, admire all the work boats. I mean, and of course, in, in the Venice area, all the things that are done by motor vehicles uh, here are done by boats there. So it's, it's kind of fascinating to see the UPS boat come by and freight deliveries and so forth. Um, this is where I asked Chill Ellen out. to hold my cone while I took a picture. <laughs> Bad idea. So you know which one she's <laughs> licking. It's not hers. <clears throat> um, and we had time to just hang out. Um, these are very laid back days. Um, we also really admired the traditional Venetian rowing boats. And on this particular island in wandering around, we just happened to come upon uh, a local rowing club and just, just wandered in and checked out all the beautiful gondolas and other rowing boats that they had um, in this club. Um, very nicely, meticulously maintained. These are the, um, 
the forculas, which are the orlocks that are used um, by the Venetians. Um, these are very, very complicated structures in which the oar can be applied in many different places, depending on how you want to maneuver the boat. And it's, it's the, the key to being able to propel a gondola. Um, and they're very customized often for the, for the individual. Um, now on to Venice itself. One day we spent exploring pretty much just Venice. And you can see from this GPS track, we, we, uh, we took a rather circuitous route. Uh, uh, this was before I had a smartphone. Uh, I didn't, my GPS didn't cover Venice. So we were, um, it was challenging to find our way, but um, the, um, we stopped on the way at, at a fortification, which I'll show you shortly, an old uh, broken down fort. Um, this area here is the Piazza San Marco, which we think of as the heart of, of Venice. We, this is a very congested area. I'll show you some photos of that. But we also explored a lot of the smaller um, out of the way canals. This is the, a fort that used to be uh, part of the defense of, of Venice and seems to have been abandoned. And at this point we needed a, a bio break and uh, we saw there was a gate ajar and that was an invitation if you're French. And so we uh, went right in there and uh, explored um, the old ruins that haven't been used for quite a long time, it appears. Um, and, um, <clears throat> and then we headed on for the main attraction. And, and this is, you know, the, the central part of, of Venice. Um, Not and, for the faint of heart. And just look at the boat traffic um, that you face on this, on this canal. Um, here we are paddling in. You can see a Vaporetto coming in from the left and many other boats up ahead. Sometimes there were even cruise ships. Um, I find this to be really an obscene sight. Uh, these massive cruise ships just seem so out of place in, in, this, in this city. Um, and I'm glad to announce, I learned this year that Venice really just this year has outlawed cruise ships in Venice proper. Um, so um, this will not be, not be happening going forward. And they also were causing damage uh, from the wave action. What we think of when we think of Venice, the boats we think of are the gondolas. And these are such amazing craft. They're, um, the ones that tourists use are very standardized. They are 36 feet long, quite heavy, propelled by one oar, one person. And that's the furcula that the oar is sitting this is, in. This is the furcula right the here furcula. that the oar is, is uh, braced on. It's not attached, it's just resting against it. And um, the skill to, to maneuver these is just amazing. Not only do they have to power them, but they have to go around these really tight corners with a 36 foot vessel. And you notice how this boat gleams. And we were warned by Arnaud, do not ever touch a gondola. And we, we didn't even ask why. We just well, were very careful. He said the gondoliers are hungry. That was <laughs> yes. the... the direct translation. But we, we paddled with the gondolas in some of the most crowded parts of Venice here. And it was really fascinating to see them uh, maneuver. And we had to be very careful to stay out of their way. It was very congested um, and very slow. You can see here, you know, sometimes you just feel like you want to melt into the walls to get out of the way. Um, and here we're going under the, the bridge of size that it goes from the Doge's Palace on the left to the prison on the right there. Um, this is a view from just outside on the on the big canal. Um, Tom got stuck here. <laughs> yeah, I, this is what the traffic was like there. And there was a canal opening just a little ways down where I came out and I just was getting bombarded by big power boats from every direction. And I went forward and back and I used my, my draw strokes and my sweep strokes. and and every stroke I've ever learned. And it was, it was uh, really scary. Um, it's the worst boat traffic I've ever seen. So um, it was a relief to get into some of the less congested parts of Venice. It was also sad to see how Venice is crumbling uh, with rises in sea levels and problem with boat wakes from motorboats and just the, the maintenance cost of these old buildings. Um, Venice is, is really suffering, but we, uh, we continued on and, and soon we left the gondolas behind and we're exploring some of the, the less uh, 
most popular parts of Venice. Um, even though they may not have been congested, they were tight. Um, the reason I'm holding my paddle in front of me is that I've just was gliding through uh, next between the wall and this work boat. Uh, there was barely room for my kayak, no room for a paddle. Um, so we were squeezing into very tight spaces and exploring all the nooks and crannies of, of Venice. And it was heartening to see that uh, even though most things are done by motorboats in Venice, there are still a lot of people using human powered boats for carrying cargo. Um, you see this quite a bit still in Venice. And lots of laundry. Um, it was challenge challenging to find a place to pull our kayaks out because it is, it is so crowded, but we occasionally did find a place to pull our boats out and see the sights on land. Um, I don't know who took that picture. Um, <laughs> and uh, anyway, we, we, we crossed back over. Here's our friend, <laughs> Michelle, who, who uh, normally doesn't have hair, but he found a very nice wig in, in the water. Um, Seaweed. And, uh, and now for a, a special paddle, um, we happen to be there on June 5th, which is Ellen's birthday. And Arnaud heard about this. And he decided to have a special little paddle for Ellen's birthday in the evening. I think we'd already done a paddle earlier in the day. Um, and he recruited a part of the group to, to, who had certain food preferences to join us. And we, we, we left and paddled just through the marshes. And after an hour or so of, of paddling through creeks and, and um, vegetation, we, we came upon Arnaud and, and the um, outrigger canoe pulled up on the bank and um, Arnaud knew that Ellen really had a fondness for grilled sardines. So he had brought a little charcoal grill and fresh sardines and he grilled up several batches of sardines, which we then um, uh, ate for dinner and they were really luscious, really wonderful. So we had a very relaxing dinner on the pickle weed um, and a huge watermelon for dessert, after which we, um, we watched the sunset and then uh, paddled back in the twilight. And it was rather a, a splendid birthday for, for Ellen. Okay, so I'm gonna move on now to a special event called the Vogelanga, which is um, translated as uh, it, it translates into gonzo. Um, <laughs> yes, Venice has a gonzo, and we were there for the 40th anniversary gonzo, or Vogelanga. Um, it was founded in about 1975 by um, uh, people in Venice who were frustrated at how motorboats had taken over everything. There were not many traditional boats left, and that the motorboats were causing a lot of damage from wakes to the buildings. And they decided they wanted to have an event for human powered craft and no motorboats allowed. And we were there for the 40th Vogelanga. Um, and they have a set route. Um, it's rather more formal than the Gonzo. Um, it's a 30 kilometer route, not 30 miles. Uh, so about 18 miles. But of course we had to paddle from near our campground, we had a, about a five and a half mile paddle to get to Venice to the starting line. And then of course back at the end. So it was a long day for us. Um, and you can see that it leaves Venice and heads north through the islands up to uh, uh, Burano and um, Mazzorbo and then back south and through um, Murano. And then eventually uh, back to the Grand Canal and um, back to our starting point. And um, here we are launching um, on the Lido, and you can see there's lots of other people with the same idea um, launching at the same place. And we headed into Venice, and there were boats coming from all directions. Uh, Ellen was number 1956, and my number happened to be 1955, which I thought was cosmic because it's my birth year, and that's just the number I was assigned. Um, and uh, more boats kept coming and more boats kept coming. And it just, we, we 
we couldn't believe there could be this many boats in one place. It turns out that there were approximately 2,300 vessels in the Vogelanga with about 8,000 people uh, participating. So it's, it's a little bit bigger than our Gonzo, um, but who knows, someday. <clears throat> No power boats were allowed in Venice that day. Yes. So uh, here we are shortly before the start. You can see it's getting really crowded. The, the women in pink are a, a team that's famous of, of uh, women survivors of breast cancer that paddle every year. Um, here's our kayak club, the outrigger canoe and kayaks. We're all waiting for things to start. Um, and here it's about to start and the gun goes off and uh, suddenly everyone is, is paddling. And the bigger boats tended to go out uh, in the lead. Um, it's really not a race, just like Argonzo is not a race. I um, think it was a race for some, for the local uh, teams. I think there were some local teams yeah. that were racing, but generally it's not a race. Um, and it wouldn't work as a race because it's, I mean, it's, <laughs> at times it's so crowded, you just, you can't move. Um, but it's a spectacular, it's so amazing to be part of such a big event. And you see so many people from all over the world who come for this event. Uh, many, many countries are represented um, and many, many different kinds of boats. And maybe we'll find some inspiration for our Gonzo. I love the hats here. This, this would be a really great addition to the Gonzo, I think. Um, here, we've, we've made it all the way to Burano. Um, and here we, we took a lunch break uh, with our pod and uh, it was a hot day. We were having to really work at hydrating. Um, here's Ellen and me in the yellow and red kayaks. I've got a sequence here of some of the traditional Venetian boats. This is one of the few gondolas that I saw. It's a long way to, to row a gondola by yourself. Um, most of the boats had uh, larger teams of, of people at the oars and um, all kinds of configurations. Most of them were, in most cases, one person would be rowing one oar, but here's a boat where you see one person with two oars, which looked kind of complicated uh, to me. And we began to really appreciate that the traditional Venetian way to row a boat is facing forward. Um, and I wanna point out this boat in the foreground, there were a lot of these boats from other countries that were row rowing boats and, and they were really scary because if you're in front of a boat like this, these people are not gonna see you and those oars are very wide and they take up a lot of the space. So there were kayaks that kind of got run over by these boats. Um, so we really liked the Venetian style a lot more. You weren't gonna get run over by one of these, one of these boats. Um, and they were really beautiful craft and a lot of skill goes into the rowing. Um, the main power boats you saw where the ambulances were still uh, zooming around. Um, you have to really watch out for ambulances. Um, as we grew, we came back into Venice, into a canal that fed into the Grand Canal, we began to run into a huge traffic jam. And the reason is there's a bridge up ahead that's very small and became kind of a choke point. And um, so it, it took quite a while to get up to, to this bridge, but we were all having a good time. And as we reached the bridge, you can see the police boats there and the policemen have these long poles that they're using to push boats through. Because a lot of these big rowing boats, there's no room for them to use their oars. And um, there were even uh, policemen that were swimmers under the bridge that were helping to move boats through. And you had to kind of kind of slip through as best you could. Um, and then it, it opened up again and we made it into the Grand Canal. Um, this is the famous Rialto Bridge as some of the popular Venetian teams came under, the crowd was throwing confetti. Um, when I went under, nobody was throwing <laughs> confetti. But anyway, it was a wonderful experience. And here we are um, at the end of the Gonzo. Um, at, at that choke point is where they were recording that you actually did the Gonzo. 
Right. <laughs> did and the Volga Longa. We actually got t-shirts and medals yeah. and posters and um, <clears throat> and then uh, our, our club pulled our kayaks out here on this dock for kind of a little siesta, a chance to rehydrate, eat, and- um, Well, and that was the end. And, and wait for the crowd to, to uh, subside a bit before we paddled our, our five or six miles back uh, to our put-in. And uh, the next day- Except we made the mistake of waiting too long and they let all the power boats back in and we had to get across from there to the other side of the Grand Canal. Right. And I remember that was one of the scariest paddles that right. we did. Uh-huh, okay, I'd forgotten that. Yeah. And um, and this was our last day in Venice. The next, that night we went out to dinner at a restaurant, the only restaurant meal we had the whole week. And, um, and the next morning on our way out, we stopped and got the newspapers all about the Vogelonga. Um, and it was, it was really a, a special event. Um, and this was in early June, um, one of our last big trips with the club. And I'm going to end with um, an unusual event that we didn't actually participate in. The, the last, um, our last experience at the club Okay. Was a was an evening potluck at the at the kayak club, and then we had to leave to go home to start packing, and the rest of the club was going to go for a, a moonlight paddle. But um, at the same time that evening, there was it was a summer weekend, and there was a big festival going on in the in the nearby town, and there was boat jousting happening. And this is the kind of boat that's used for boat jousting. Uh, they have usually ten or twelve oars and a big rack on the stern. And the jouster has a long lance and a shield. And they're located about 10 feet above the water surface. And this is a traditional sport that uh, began, um, it's been known from Greek and Roman times, but it's been quite well known from um, the French coast of the Mediterranean since about 1200. And the town of Set, where this photo was taken, Actually, uh, when it was founded in the 1660s, um, boat jousting was a big deal when it was first founded. So it's been a, a, a real strong tradition there. And here is the event in, um, in the town that we witnessed. And you can see here the red boat with their jouster and the blue boat. And what the boats do is they, they uh, move toward one another. And as they go past one another, uh, that's when the jousters can contact each other with their lances and try to knock. The goal is to knock the other one off of the boat, and whoever is left standing is the winner. And I have a couple of short video clips. Um, <laughs> Now you notice that now they're turning around and, and the next person on the on the rack there stands up. Uh, he will take the place of the previous jouster. And um, this boat that's motoring around, they're not going to pick up the swimmer. They're going to pick up the shield, which they're going to give back to the boat so they can reuse it. But the, the, uh, the jouster has to swim to the shore and pull himself up. Um, and so now they're preparing for the next round. Um, let's go on to the next one here. There's a brass band. I liked I liked his style. Um, I don't know if they get points for style or not, but but the crowd liked it. And while we were watching this go on, we realized that our kayak club had shown up 
Um, and, and they were going out to the Mediterranean for a moonlight paddle and uh, they needed to wait for a break in the competition. So they were watching the competition and then as, um, as, uh, as there was a little break, the paddle club um, headed out to the Mediterranean and um, this actually was our last sight of, of the kayak club. Um, they headed out to the Mediterranean and we jumped on our bikes and headed back home um, to start packing for the, for the trip home. And um, it, was, it was basically, a, it was a really um, important part of our experience. Um, having uh, this in common with people made it possible for us to really get to know and become friends with people in a way that's very difficult to do in another country. Um, so if you find yourself living abroad, I encourage you to find an activity like this that you can share with a local club and, and um, really find a way to be connected with other people. This was a really important part of our experience in France. And I think that's it. Yep. So. The end. Fabulous. Any I'm questions? Sure, sure there's some questions. There's a lot of questions in oh. the chat. Um, how many members does the club have? Do you remember? Uh, I'm not sure if it we was- We don't know. It was several hundred. Yeah. It, I'm guessing it might've been four or 500, but I don't remember the number. Yeah. Um, keep in mind that it was sea kayaks, uh, surf skis, and also the, um, the Polynesian outriggers. So they, they were slightly different I and mean, they were overlapping groups. Um, but that sort of broadened the club so that it brought in more, more different people um, that way. Let's see. Um, I have a question about um, <clears throat> the crossing the canals in Venice. Okay, so I, there, there aren't any more questions in the chat. Does anybody else have any questions? Yeah, I have a question about uh, crossing the canals in, in Venice. Um, my uh, experience with uh, Italian cities like Rome is the best way to cross a busy road is just walk. Only if you hesitate, you get run over. Did you try that? Um, how contaminated is the water in Venice? Would you roll there? <laughs> and that's a good question. Well, yeah. you know, it was interesting because in, uh, yeah, in the canals in Venice, the water seemed not terribly clean. But when we were paddling out in the areas um, in the lagoon, there were people out there swimming. And um, so I don't know how clean the water was, but it was um, it, it was considered a place where, uh, you know, people were out enjoying the beach uh, in the lagoon. Genevieve. Yeah. Hi. Well, this is like such an awesome talk. Thanks so much. You're muted, Genevieve. You're, we can't hear you, oh. Genevieve. You're not muted, but... Yeah, maybe my volume's down. Oh, wait. Mm -hmm. Oh. Hold on. I can hear her. I can hear her. Hear her. Our sound was I down. I think I had turned Sorry. my sound down. Sorry. Oh, good. <laughs> um, I can hear you. Okay, I just want to say that was super cool and inspirational. Um, and, and that club, oh my God, like, you know, 200 euros with like those fantastic facilities with like those really nice boats and like, is that normal? <laughs> well, so one of the things that we discovered in France is that the French government is very interested in promoting healthy activities, like physical activities. So all the parks have park courses. Um, there are all kinds of public swimming pools around. And we don't know exactly the details, but we did know that the, the building was donated by the city of Montpellier and that the mayor of Palavas was involved in the kayak club. And um, so there was definitely government support. Now the two instructors who, um, you know, ran these different classes several days a week in the summertime, they would run uh, tourist. They, they kind of doubled, they didn't teach classes for the kayak club. They would teach 
they would take tourists out on trips and charge for it. So, so they were kind of a combination of, you know, rental kayak service and tour guides. And then in the, in the off season, they would run this, this, um, kayak training. And there, and this was not the only such club. Uh, when we would bicycle down the Les, there, there were two places where we would pass river kayak clubs that also had buildings and, and slalom courses and boats and everything. And I think all of this stuff is, is subsidized by the government. So cool, thanks. Your photographs were really beautiful. And I um, was trying to imagine you being in the boat with your camera, getting all those photographs. That's quite a feat. Well, a lot of the, the pictures in Venice were actually somebody else's photographs. Well, the, the, oh. of the Voga Longa, um, yeah. there were some club members who did not paddle the Voga Longa, and they were going around taking photographs with nice cameras. So there were some pictures that um, that I borrowed from other club members for that. Uh, my pictures weren't 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 the best. <laughs> <laughs> they told a great story. It was really wonderful presentation. Thank you. I hope everyone is inspired for for our Gonzo and just think <laughs> just think of the possibilities. <laughs> Maybe we can kick all the ships off the bay for the next Gonzo. Yeah. <laughs> Did you make any uh, lifelong friends there that you maintain contact with? You know, I think that we probably could have stayed in contact with people, but um, a lot of a lot of water has gone under the bridge since then for us. And we had it hoped to go back um, on future sabbaticals and do the same thing. But um, Ellen's subsequent sabbaticals, her, her mom's health had gotten to the point where Ellen could not be that far away for a length of time. So we, we weren't able to, to go back. We and did go back the next summer. For and a few weeks. For just a few weeks. And we went down and visited the club. But, um, you know, it's not the same to just go visit than as it is to belong and, and go paddling with them. And, uh, you know, maybe we'll go back. We know that Arnaud is still there. All right. Okay. Well, thank you for an incredible tour. Things we never thought of in raising the bar on the Gonzo. Sheesh. <laughs> and the club. We're going to have to have a clubhouse now.